Hello and welcome to Coasa Political Society Show. I'm your host, Marcus Rowland. On this episode, we will be covering universal health care, the campaign of Steve Bullock. But to start with, tonight, a story from Alabama. A recently proposed bill from the southern state will institute a ban on almost all cases of abortion, most notably including rape and incest. The proposed law will overturn the 1973 Supreme Court ruling of Roe v. Wade. Earlier this year, Louisiana tried to pass a law changing their abortion law, but this was blocked by a Supreme Court decision. This is happening now because people have been emboldened by the addition of two Trump-nominated Supreme Court justices. The authors of the bill hope for the Supreme Court to overturn the landmark decision completely. The bill passed the Alabama Senate 25-6, to 6, and some have noted that all those who voted in favor of the bill were white men. The only concession is that the bill would allow abortions when the mother's life is in risk. Doctors who attempt an abortion illegally would face 10 years in prison, and those who carry out an abortion would face 99 years in prison. On to another topic. A primary topic for the 2020 presidential election is universal health care. Leading the charge on universal health care is candidate and junior senator from New Hampshire, Bernie Sanders. The debate is as much an economic one as it is a social issue. Many people have been comparing the rising cost of private health care to the potential cost of publicly run system. It is estimated that in the short run it would cost more to set up uh, a publicly run health care system, but in the long run it would cost less for the average American than their current health coverage. There is one thing that everyone seems to agree on, and that is the current system has to change. Both Republicans and Democrats agree to that. A widely popular and proposed solution is price controls. It is simply unreasonable for simple and often necessary drugs and medicines to cost as much as they do. The reason that is given by pharmaceutical companies is that it covers the cost of research and development of these drugs, but it seems exorbitant the way it currently is. The primary reason why most people do not want a universal health care system is that they don't trust the government to do it right, or they don't trust the government with treating their illnesses. But if people can't do that, it shows a much larger issue at hand. I'd now like to turn to our panelists for some debate on universal health care and how this may impact the 2020 presidential election. I'd like to introduce our panelists. I have Calder and Nina on the left, and I have Sean and Matt on the right. So we are discussing universal health care, um, and I know this is a hot topic for the 2020 Democratic candidates. Does anybody have any opening thoughts? Um, I think this is, I think, one of the big there are like big pushes in the 2020 election. It's a um, it's like a flat plan for many of them. It's like one of their founding ideas, along with like climate change stuff. Um, I know Warren's been pushing it. Bernie's been pushing it. Uh, Beto and Harris were recently talking about it. Biden's because Biden's become sort of the front runner. He's been under a lot of scrutiny for his, you know, he doesn't support Medicare for all in the way he does, no way he doesn't. And I think a lot of them, because Medicare for all is such a sort of super liberal idea, I think a lot more of the um, centrist Dems like. Biden and Harris are sort of, they've said things like, oh, we support Medicare for like, I'm not, it's not called Medicare for many, but it's basically that where it's like cheaper Medicare or Medicare for more people. And I think that it has become, I think we're seeing a split in the candidates right now between people like Warren and Bernie and people like Biden, Buttigieg, Beto, Harris on that like uh, centrist liberal front on like, and this is like one of their major issues is do we uh, go all in with Medicare for All? Well, I think there are many virtues and also pitfalls of the Medicare for All plan. On one hand, it does acknowledge the fact that healthcare is a right and it does guarantee it for the entire population. But on the other hand, it eliminates choice for people who wish to pay for better healthcare, according to some plans. Again, there are many candidates introducing different variations of this policy, but that seems to be a common theme in some of it. Well, I don't think it's honestly going to happen anytime soon. And there are, as you said, a lot of like good points and bad points. But I think if it was like carefully evaluated, studied from other countries and like see like the high points and the low points, you could find some way to do it. I just don't think it's going to happen now with just like everything that's going on, even though it's like one of the big talks. I honestly think something like college and like student debt is like bigger. Um, I think she's a good point. I think the Democrats, maybe some of the more centrist ones, are going to try to use this like a um, like sort of how some of the some of them are using like either the Green New Deal or I saw Congressman at Works um, new climate change plan. They're going to use it as like 
this. Oh, that's way out here. Let's pull it back a little bit. You know, still, there. I think it's called the Overton window. They want to like sort of like widen the gap on things that people will accept so they can accept something that's a little better than what we have, but not exactly Medicare for all. Well, I think that if the United States is going to adopt a underlying Medicare for all system, it should not come alone. It should also come with new regulations to ensure and prop up the public's general health so the system is not completely overburdened. Like, for example, drug use, mainly opioid use, and obesity is spiking because opioid companies are bribing doctors to prescribe their drug, and also many food companies are fighting against regulations that will put accurate warning labels on their food. So I think that, among a lot of other issues, many numerous, too many to address, that that, that could help to ease the expense of a universal health care plan. So you're basically saying, in addition to universal health care, we should like arrest the Sackler family and the heads of Big Big Pharma? I'm not familiar with the specifics of Big Pharma or opioids, but I'm sure that will have something to do with it. Um, so this was a, an idea that was campaigned by Bernie Sanders for the uh, 2016 election cycle. Um, is it surprising that it's suddenly become like the front and center issue when it was more like a fringe left issue? I don't think so. Honestly, it probably because like sides like Republican and Democrats have become a lot more like polarized as like the whole 2016 election and like then on has shown. And I think people have just moved towards more radical ideas in order to try and get something done. And as we can see, nothing really has gotten done just because everyone's like saying no and there's no compromises right now. I agree. I, it has con, 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 con come from a marginalized area to a more front and center one. And I think it could be because the Republicans pointing out flaws with plans of Democrats and then the Democrats fight back making the flaw said flawed out plans front more front and center than had they not been pointed out by the Republicans. Mm -hmm. So are you saying the flawed plans are from the Republicans or from the Democrats? I'm saying that the Republicans point out what they deem flawed. Okay. And then the R Democrats are, for the sake of arguing, both sides are f arguing for the sake of arguing at this point, um, move it towards the front burner to be set, okay. to sit per se. Well, I think that the reason that this public debate has become so polarized and intensified is because of the great moral stakes that come with health care, you know. You have poor people that can't afford health care and might die if they cannot reach health care in time. And then you have, in, in, social, in countries like Canada, for example, and where the UK, you have situations where the government dictates that certain patients cannot receive care or people uh, die and sometimes they die in waiting for their care due to long wait times. I would agree with that. My sister has a friend in Canada and his parents wait for weeks on end for doctor's appointments and despite that you know universal health care could be a great thing just waiting weeks just can't do it sometimes although I know people who wait weeks here and we don't have universal health care so it's just kind of like I don't know I, I think the primary issue that people are concerned about universal health care is they're the people that don't have any health care or have really bad health care that want universal health care. And then there's a, there's, a, there's a group of people who have the same level of health care now that they would have under universal health care, so they don't really see a need to switch. And then there are people now that have better health care than they would have under universal health care, and they obviously don't want that to become any different or any worse than it already is, or like for it to change. So is there like a way for I know uh, like Germany and other countries have a two-tiered system where um, like you can have private and also have universal health care. Would that be more? I know that's more lonely um, health care for many. Um, I think that's a pretty good idea. Like, I think that there should be 
maybe a baseline year for healthcare, but you should be, if you have the money to afford better healthcare, you should be able to afford it and get that better healthcare. But I think there needs to be a fine line between we could evolve into a situation where that like quote unquote baseline healthcare is so awful that like it's basically not healthcare at all. Yeah. Um, some of the ideas like that I saw, I'm not, I'm not her biggest fan, but Elizabeth Warren's, um, she's advocating that uh, we need universal healthcare for like children, which I think is an excellent idea. Um, vaccinations. Vaccinations, yeah. Um, obviously I think we've seen in New York with the measles outbreak <laughs> and in Washington state. It's like, th there's no reason that kids should not have universal healthcare. It's like, as Matt said, it's a human right, and I mean, they're the next generation. They need that right. <laughs> it's if we all live because mm -hmm. of climate change. Oh, yeah, that too. Well, Which doesn't exist. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, climate change doesn't exist. Thank well, you. But, uh, I think a two tiered <laughs> system would be a good way to reconcile the internal virtues of both the conservative argument and the liberal argument being choice versus obligation to provide care. But I think it's interesting to see that the common thread between Republicans and even Democrats is that no one really seems to be eager to stick with the current system of health care. Well, I think we've solved it right there. Um, get a two-tiered <laughs> system, just go to Germany, pluck it and drop it in, and it'll all work. Um, that is uh, all the time that we have for uh, this segment. Um, so we will do it on into our next one. Our third topic of the night is once again campaign coverage. Steve Bullock is the current governor of Montana. He's the 23rd major candidate to announce his intention to run for the Democratic nominee. Governor Bullock's primary campaign pitch is that he is a Democrat who could beat Trump. He is the governor of Montana, a state that Trump carried by over 20 points. So he has a track record to show that he can win in Trump country. Among other things, Steve Bullock is the proudest of his protection of net neutrality in Montana. He signed a special law to keep net neutrality in his state. He's calling for other states to do so as well. He intends to make this a primary issue on the campaign trail and something that he intends to fix as president. The governor has an interesting take on a solution to fixing the ever-rising cost of college. He is encouraging apprenticeships. So far, this has had moderated success in Montana. But Montana has, unlike the rest of the country, a greater range of hands-on uh, principal jobs. While Bullock is the 23rd candidate to announce for the Democrats, he has garn garnered more attention. This is most notably because he is a governor. Another thing is going for him is that he is 53, a relatively mature and young age compared to the frontrunners Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, both of whom are in their late 70s. Steve Bullock is still young compared to another top tier candidate, Elizabeth Warren. This is good for him, seeing as many Democrats are young and many more are looking for new leadership in the party. Overall, he stands a good chance and has a long road ahead of him. Welcome back to A World View. On this episode, we will be looking into South Africa. Humans have been living in what is South Africa longer than anywhere else in the world. South Africa contains some of the oldest archaeological and human fossil sites in the world. Archaeologists have recovered extensive fossil remains from a series of caves in Guantang province. The, the area a, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been called the Cradle of Humanity. Modern humans lived in South Africa at least 170,000 years ago, but modern history begins much, much more recently. In 1487, the Portuguese explorer Bartolomeu Dias led the first European voyage to land in southern Africa. On December the 4th, he landed at Walkfish Bay, known today as Wavis Bay in Namibia. This was south of the furthest point reached in, eight, in 1485 by his predecessor, the Portuguese navigator Diego Kea. Dias continued down the western coast of southern Africa. After the 8th of January, 1488, Prevented by storms from proceeding along the coast, he sailed out of sight of land and passed the southernmost point of Africa without seeing it. By the early 17th century, Portugal's maritime power had started to decline, and English and Dutch merchants competed to oust Lisbon from its lucrative monopoly on the spice trade. Representatives from the British East India Company did call sporadically at the Cape in search of provisions as early as 1601 but later came in favor of the Ascension Islands and St. Helena as alternative ports for refuge. Dutch interest was found aroused 
after 1647, when two employees of the Dutch East India Company were shipwrecked there for several months. In 1652, a century and a half after the discovery of the Cape Sea Route, Jan van der Kbeck established a virtual calling station at the Cape of Good Hope, at what would become today Cape Town, on behalf of the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch imported large numbers of slaves from other parts of the Africa and Indonesia. This led to some of the most culturally diverse places on earth. This led to the development of a new ethnic group called the Cape Colards, most of whom adopted the Dutch language and the Christian faith. The eastward expansion of the Dutch colonists ushered in a series of wars with the southwardly migrating Yosha tribe, known as Yosha Wars, as both sides competed for pasteurized land necessary to graze their cattle near the Great Fish River. Great Britain occupied Cape Town between 1795 and 1803 to prevent it from falling under the control of the First French Republic, which had invaded the Low Countries. Despite briefly returning to Dutch rule under the Bavarian Republic in 1803, the Cape was occupied again by the British in 1806. Following the end of the Napoleonic Wars, it was formally ceded to Great Britain and became an integral part of the British Empire. British immigration to South Africa began around 1818, subsequently culminating in the arrival of 1820 settlers. The new colonists were induced to settle for various reasons, namely to increase the size of the European workforce and to bolster frontier regions against the Yosha incursions. In the first two decades of the 19th century, the Zulu people grew in power and expanded their territory under their leader, Saka. During the early 1800s, many Dutch settlers departed from the Cape Colony, where they had been subject to British control. They migrated to the future Natal, or Natal Orange Free State and Transvaal regions. The Boers founded the Boer Republic, the South Africa Republic, and the Orange Free State. The discovery of diamonds in 1867 and gold in 1884 in the interior started the Mineral Revolution and increased the economic growth and migration. This intensified British efforts to gain control over indigenous peoples. The struggle to control these important economic resources was a factor in relations between Europeans and in indigenous people who were, all, who were between the Boer and the British. The Anglo-Zulu War was fought in 1879 between the British Empire and the Zulu Kingdoms. The Boer Republic successfully resisted British encroachments during the First Boer War 1880-1881 using guerrilla warfare tactics as well as institute local conditions. The British returned with greater numbers, more experience, and new strategy in the Second Boer War, 1899-1902, but suffered heavy casualties through attrition. Nonetheless, they were successful. Within the country, anti-British policies among white Southern Africans focused on independence. During the Dutch and British colonial years, racial segregation was mostly informal, though some legislation had been enacted to control the settlement and movement of Native people including Native Location Act of 1879 and the system of past laws. Eight years after the end of the Second Boer War and four years of negotiation, an act of the British Parliament, South Africa Act 1909, granted nominal independence, which created the Union of South Africa on the 31st of May 1910. In 1931, the Union was fully sovereign from the United Kingdom with the passage of the Statute of Westminster, which abolished the last powers of the British government on the country. In 1948, the National Party was elected to power. It strengthened the racial segregation begun under the Dutch and British colonial rule, taking Canada's Indian Act as the framework. The Nationalist government classified all people into three races and developed rights and limitations for each. The white minority, less than 20% of the population, controlled the larger black majority. The legal institutionalization se segregation became known as apartheid. While whites enjoyed the highest standard of living in all of Africa, comparable to first world nations, the black majority remained disadvantaged by almost every standard, including income, education, housing, and life expectancy. On the 31st of May, 1961, the country became a republic following a referendum in which white voters narrowly voted in favor thereof. Queen Elizabeth II was stripped of the title of Queen of South Africa, and the last Governor General, Charles Robert Stewart, became the state president. As a concession to Westminster system, the president remained parliamentary appointed and virtually powerless until the PW, both his Constitution Act of 1983, which eliminated the office of Prime Minister and instated a, new, a near unique strong presidency responsible to the parliament. Pressured by other Commonwealth nation countries, South Africa withdrew from the organization in 1961 and rejoined only in 1994. Despite opposition both within and outside the country, the government legislation for the continuation of apartheid. 
The security forces cracked down on internal dissent and violence became widespread with anti-apartheid organizations such as the African National Congress, the Azarian People Organization, and the Pan-Africanist Congress, carrying out guerrilla warfare and urban sabotage. The three rival resistance movements also engaged in occasional interior fractional clashes as they jockeyed for domestic influence. Apartheid became increasingly controversial, and several countries began to boycott Mises with the South African government because of its racial policies. These measures were extended to international sanctions and the disinvestment of holdings by foreign investors. In the late 1970s, South Africa initiated a program of nuclear weapons development. In the decade that followed, it produced six deliverable nuclear weapons. The Mahambi Declaration of Faith, signed by Maghuthu Bithumisi and Harry Schwartz in 1974, enshrined the principles of peace, full transition of power, and equality for all. The first such agreement by the black and white leaders in, in South Africa. Ultimately, F.W. Clark opened bilateral discussions with Nelson Mandela in 1993 for a transition of policies and government. In 1990, the National Party took control and the first steps towards dismantling discrimination when it lifted the ban on the ANC and other political organizations. It released Nelson Mandela from prison after 27 years of serving a sentence for sabotage. A negotiation process followed. With approval from white ele electorate in 1992 referendum, the government continued negotiations to end apartheid. South Africa also destroyed its nuclear arsenal and acceded to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. South Africa has held its first universal elections in 1994, which the ANC won by an overwhelming majority. It has been in power ever since. The country rejoined the Commonwealth of Nations and became a member of the South African development community. Today, South Africa is a part of the ever ebb and flow in groups of nations called BRICS, which stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. South Africa is ever in the process of trying to move from a poor developing country to a developed country. Its development is being hurt by its ongoing AIDS epidemic, though the South African government is trying to combat this issue. The future looks bright for South Africa. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this episode. I'll see you next time.